Okay, if you were an alien studying American culture today, you might conclude that the children are in danger. Aid is on your side this week, looking at the most dangerous things impacting our children. We're in the midst of a full-on moral panic, the likes of which hasn't been seen since your mom warned you about creepy men in white vans. For their part, Vice credits this to the mainstreaming of QAnon, i.e. the decentralized conspiracy group that believes things like, uh, like Hillary Clinton pours kids' blood over her Fruit Loops. Vice notes that in recent months, QAnon talking points have been increasingly adopted by mainstream news, especially especially as it pertains to threats against children. According to reporter David Gilbert's investigation, in a single month during 2022, Fox News ran 51-hour segments discussing pedophilia and sex offenders. And it's not just the media cashing in on this moral panic. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis made headlines when he signed a bill into law that forbids teachers from discussing or even answering questions about sexual orientation or gender identity. Because of that, if you're a student in Florida, just ask any questions you have about sexual orientation or gender identity in the comments, and we got you. DeSantis can't stop us. Known as the Don't Say Gay Law, this legislation has been widely criticized, as have companies who donated to politicians that supported it. We're not gonna say any names here, but what's up, Mr. Disney? We talk about this in our recent video on book banning. But the thing is, a lot of this all has to do with what's being taught in school. A conversation that has gotten so wildly charged that the FBI has started tracking threats to school board members. And we're happy that the FBI is protecting school board members rather than doing things like, I don't know, trying to get Martin Luther King Jr. to kill himself, a thing they really did, look it up. But what do violent scenes at school board meetings over mask mandates and MLK Jr. books, the uptick in groomer discourse on Fox News, and the recent clashes at drag story hours all have in common? You guessed it kids. Oh, and also libs of TikTok. They definitely have all of that in common. See, children are at the root of these contentious debates, with politicians on both sides appealing to the innocence of children and their need to be protected by more robust public policy. But political discourse centered around children is nothing new, nor is politicians using children to emotionally appeal to voters. So what is it about children that makes for such persuasive political talking points? And is this discourse actually productive, i.e., is it making children safer? And when politicians appeal to childhood innocence, is it really just emotional manipulation? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition when kids become political tools. But before we get into it, I wanted to take a second and tell you about our stream. It's called Wisecrack Live. It happens every Thursday at 11 a.m. Pacific. It's hosted by me. Um, and I'd love it if you would join us. We dive deep into everything going on in internet culture. We watch stuff, we talk about stuff, and we have a hell of a time in the chat. So join us Thursday, 11 a.m. Pacific on Wisecrack Live. And if you wanna check out old episodes first, you just click the live tab on our page and you can watch them there. And even though the chat won't be live, you can act like it is maybe, that could be fun too. Uh, but now, back to the show. To understand the political discourse about childhood today, it helps to take a look back at how politicians have used children to their benefit in the past. The most well-known political use of children is that disgustingly germy habit of kissing babies. <laughs> One of the earliest recorded examples of the now cliche campaign trail staple occurred when notable douchebag President Andrew Jackson was approached by a poor woman with a small child while visiting Princeton. Jackson took the child from her arms, proclaimed him a fine specimen of American childhood, presented the kid's dirty face to his secretary, John Eaton, and said, kiss him. No baby in arm's reach of a politician would ever be safe again. Fun fact, I was kissed repeatedly by Ronald Reagan as a child, and it ruined me, and it made me this way. So, screw you, Ronald Reagan, and your god kissy lips. By the late 1880s, kissing babies had become a well-known political move to gain favor with mothers. And by 1950, Life Magazine even ran an article on how to do the photo op just right. But why did this practice become a means of testing whether or not a politician was ready to occupy the highest office in the US? Maybe it's because parents feel proud when a future president holds their child. Maybe it's because watching a person who's about to be granted the nuclear codes show a glimmer of humanity, especially familial love, is comforting to voters. Or, most cynically, it could be that childhood is associated with innocence. And by being seen holding or kissing a baby, these politicians can distance themselves from the, uh, well, the less innocent aspects of their records. In fact, that association between childhood and innocence 
has not only made children effectively political props on the campaign trail, but it is also the driving force behind moral panics in politics. Now, the idea of childhood as a time of innocence is so ingrained in our culture that we rarely stop to think about where it actually came from. While ancient Greeks and later Christians conceived of children as naturally innocent, they mostly didn't treat them as such. For example, in the Middle Ages, the average child, aged seven to nine, was sent away to be an apprentice or servant regardless of social class. Those who study medieval art contend that children are depicted as essentially mini adults. But this started to change in the 17th century as enlightenment thinkers popularized the conception of childhood innocence as something worth protecting. As scholar Carrie H. Robinson writes, the discourse of childhood innocence gained prominence and religious moral entrepreneurs of the time began to argue for increased modesty and greater surveillance and control of children's behavior. This further increased with the romantic literature of the 18th century, like Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Emile, which painted children as naturally good because they're close to nature, a quality they would lose when they grew into gross adults. This would all be followed by the Industrial Revolution and rise of urban middle-class values and morality, which privileged childhood innocence and saw them under increased surveillance by the emerging nuclear family. Though obviously lots of working class kids were not afforded such assumptions of innocence and had to work in literal mines and other places where their tiny hands and brittle bones were helpful. Also continuing into the present day, the presumption of innocence has largely been something only white kids enjoy, or you know, resent. But for those middle-class children, scholar Patricia Holland argues, things had changed. And now childhood was part of a more comfortable lifestyle based on an ideal of domesticity and privacy. Romantic notions of childhood combined with compulsory public education and eventually in age segregated schools further cemented the divide between adulthood and childhood, privileging childhood as a separate era of one's life. The mid 19th century in America saw a rise of political activism surrounding children's welfare, including labor laws, access to drugs and alcohol, shifting age of consent laws and regulations on where children could live. Robinson writes that reforms were ideologically influenced beyond just wanting to keep kids safe from harm, believing that children required special attention and protection for the sake of their moral development, a perspective influenced by Christian and conservative values. By the 1930s, anthropologist Ruth Benedict observed that American society went to great extremes to differentiate children from adults and mandated that children were to be protected from the ugly facts of life. All of this culminated in what scholar Vavina Zelizer described as the transition from the economically useful child to the economically useless but emotionally priceless child. The kind of child that, you know, you really, really want to protect from everything bad in the world. In fairness, I think I was both an economically and emotionally useless child. But you know, if my mom or any of my teachers from school want to jump in in the comments, let me know, except for Miss, oh, was it Miss Richardson from fifth grade? If you're still alive, f you. She was the worst, just the worst. Scholar Hugh Cunningham even argues that the innocent child as the icon of Western civilization has practically become a substitute for religion. And this has real ramifications. As Robinson notes, the emotional capital invested in the child provides fertile ground in which to manifest social anxiety and moral panic. Since the 1960s, increased awareness of the realities of child sexual abuse has led to a series of moral panics around things like stranger danger and pedophilia, with suspected perpetrators often being queer folks. And that's when the politicization of children really ramped up. Especially in recent years, there's been a growing ambient sense that children are always at risk of harm. These are our children. They skip down our streets, but the pedophile is waiting. Robinson argues that the perception of risk can operate as a powerful means of social control, maintaining the status quo and dominant power relations underpinning societal inequalities. For example, scholar Kristen Davies contends that the image of the innocent child has been used to put limitations on the lives of adults, particularly queer adults. Think of the discourse surrounding trans women today which frequently boils down to the contention that trans women using bathrooms with young girls is dangerous, despite all the evidence that this is a myth. Sociologist Janice Irvine argues that in this way, panic around children and sexuality is used, especially by enterprising politicians, to foment strong emotions in communities in order to erode sexual rights. 
In other words, anytime rights based around sex or gender are expanded, politicians can simply yell, but what about the children to try and stop it? It also seems like those same politicians are always like, oh, let's go to, let's go to church though. We need these kids back in church, especially the Catholic church where they're safe, where nothing bad has ever happened to children, you know? You know, it's like Google it, guys. This also has material effects on the kinds of things people want their children to be taught in school. Anxiety around sex ed is a prime example. What? Sexual education? Where'd you get this? I told you it's school. Oh, I thought we didn't have to worry about this until ninth grade health class. With the topic being a flashpoint since schools became more involved in the subject in the 1970s and later largely adopted abstinence-only sex education during the AIDS crisis. Uh, I know we're all different ages and from different countries here, but let us know if you had any weird sex ed stuff at school in the comments. I just remember being sent into a separate room where all the girls and all the boys went to one room and we saw a video and then on the playground, it was like, what did you guys learn? And then, you know, nothing. Uh, nothing until a couple years later when a kid on the school bus named Will told me that sex is when a man pees inside of a woman. I believed that probably two years longer than I should have. But let us know your sex ed stories in the comments. Sociologist Sonika Elliott argues that these debates are about far more than the sex education curriculum. They are fueled by and reproduce deep anxieties about childhood sexuality, gender, marriage, and the institution of the family. The notion of children as innocent and in need of protection makes for strong emotions about their access to sex education, which some fear might corrupt them. At the same time, the abstinence-only education children commonly receive is typically framed in gender normative and heteronormative lenses that render it irrelevant to many students. Robinson notes that there's a dominant discourse that holds that children are naturally heterosexual, which drives the kinds of anxiety around gender identity that leads to the don't say gay bill. As such, Robinson argues that the regulation of children's access to sexual knowledge plays a critical role in the production of children as heteronormative sexual subjects. This regulation has serious implications for both the immediate and long-term health and well-being of children throughout their lives. In short, anxiety around children's innocence makes them great political tools, but the end result is often policies that hurt children who don't conform to gender or sexual norms. But how does all this actually affect children? Well, along with being highly politicized, they're also largely denied autonomy, rights, full citizenship, and agency, as well as participation and inclusion in social, economic, political, and educational decision-making. Robinson argues that anxieties around the construction of childhood are used in trivializing children's active involvement in decision-making in both their own lives and in broader socio-cultural political areas. As such, the same conceptions that make children such an evocative topic for politicians also allot them very little say in what their lives actually look like. A scholar Henry Giroux argues, lacking opportunities to vote, mobilize, or register their opinions, young children become an easy target and referent in discussions of moral uplift and social legitimation. They also become pawns and victims. Or as Robinson puts it, the apolitical child thus becomes a powerful political tool. But is there a way beyond children's main political impact being passive? Are kids fated to remain political tools? Or can they reclaim some agency? As scholars Allison Gash and Daniel Tickner ask, what happens when young people break free of the constraints, reject the protections, and instead assert themselves as autonomous actors? We got one answer when then 15-year-old Greta Thunberg skipped school to protest outside the Swedish parliament to call attention to the climate crisis, starting a worldwide movement that has involved millions. And it's also put one horrible sex predator douchebag in jail, hopefully forever. Similarly, the 2017 March for Our Lives, founded by the survivors of the school shooting in Parkland, Florida, drew 800,000 supporters to Washington, D.C., in addition to inspiring 800 worldwide protests in solidarity with their fight for gun reform. While it's tempting to view these examples as anomalies or as a byproduct of internet activism, young people have been at the forefront of political change and action throughout the 20th century. For instance, Gash and Tickner point to the Freedom Riders and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which were led by young people and had a tremendous impact on the civil rights movement. Although children today might never learn about that because of like book bans and their, and their school board intimidation, still the lingering sentiment that children and all their innocence ought not to be actively involved in political life 
looms large. It can be seen in Donald Trump's comment that Greta Thunberg should stop agitating and chill and go see a movie. The infantilization of children thus also makes it harder for children to be actualized as political subjects. While many would be content to keep using children and their presumed aura of innocence to aid their own political agendas, we suspect young people will continue to do what they've long done, reclaim that agency, reshape the narrative, and be active agents rather than passive talking points for politicians. At the same time, many will keep using pizza gates and drag story hours and sex ed teachers talking about butt plugs and, uh, and politicians stealing children to drink their adrenochrome to push forward their own agendas. And in doing so, children will remain depoliticized instruments for the political maneuvering of geriatrics with second homes. But what do you think? When children become talking points for politicians, do we forget the children are actually people? Or is childhood innocence really something that should be protected at all costs? Let us know what you think in the comments. Huge thanks to our patrons for all your support. If you want to join this collection of poets and scholars, please consider it. There is a link in the description. And please do like, subscribe, leave comments if you enjoyed this video. As always, thank you so much for watching, and we'll catch you later.